of the LPVO and it's shining light forward on that reticle and it hits that silver and it reflects back and scatters that light back towards my eyes. Voila, red or green illumination, depending on what color your LD, LED is. But it's called the doublet because obviously <laughs> once you have this reticle done, you want to protect it. It has to be absolutely clean because um, that's going to be in focus with your little fast focus ocular, right? So if there's any specks, if there's any grease, dirt, a hair, yeah. you're going to see that, right? It's going to fail QC. Ah, oh, there's a hair in this one. You know, goes in the trash can, right? So it has to be absolutely clean. So what they do is, while it's still in the clean room and absolutely perfect, they put another piece of glass on top of it, sandwich it, and then they glue all around the outside of that, epoxy it. So it's it's a doublet. It's two pieces of glass with the reticle. With the etched yeah, reticle. Yeah, the etched reticle in the middle okay. of it. And the whole thing is like, I mean, it's, it's like... With you him. have taken so yeah. Kurt, I have seen him shoot. Yeah, that boy yeah. can shoot. That boy can shoot. Yes, he can. We so a couple what was it, a couple months ago, back this summer, he he messaged me, he's like, Hey, do you like MMA? I'm like, depends. <laughs> <laughs> that's the, that's the right like, answer. D- depends. <laughs> Why? And he's like, Oh, we got we got we got a table at this fight. We got we know the guy who's fighting here in Houston and there's just three of us going. Do you want to go? I'm like, yeah. 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 And so me and Ian went and like showed up and it was in like the nicest east side of Houston <laughs> neighborhood. <laughs> I'm like, all right, cool. Well, looks like the, the parking lot's nice and secure. But that was a it was a fun time going in and watching the fight. I would lo- I would jump at the opportunity again to go watch another fight. So but, in another life, years and years ago, I uh I actually used to do photos of still photos. I like photography, do a lot of photography. I did still photos of MMA fights that were sponsored by CMMG in Columbia, <laughs> Missouri, where nice. I went to law school. And uh, CMMG would sponsor these fights, and I'd climb up. They had like a little crow's nest up there, and I could climb up and I could shoot down at the at the fighters and get still pictures of them. You know, like the the right hook with yeah. the sweat coming off the guy's face. That was like the goal was to get those cool action shots. And that was that was really cool. I mean, talk about an amazing seat, you know. You've been around a minute, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this this beard's white. Let's see, <laughs> you were. I don't think we were in Missouri at the same time. I was in Missouri at um, from 2010 to 2013. That was right, what, right when I left. Right when you left. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now I went to uh, went to college in the 90s. Graduated. I graduated college in 2000. Got out of law school in 03, and I did all my schooling in Missouri. Tried to be a lawyer, had a wife, had a whole life, um, had a FFL and a SOT. I built machine guns, did all that stuff. Built I built probably 650 AKs in my life um, from parts kits when that was a thing. Yeah. Before, before the Dark Ages, before <laughs> the barrel ban, you know, a more civilized era. <laughs> um, but but back when you could build, you know, we, we could we could buy build a parts kit. You know, we could buy parts kits in bulk for ninety nine bucks. Yeah, put a thirty five dollar receiver on it, and maybe fifty dollars in U S. parts, and build a four hundred dollar AK. Back when you could get like a SAR one for two hundred eighty nine bucks. Well, ours were premium; they were four hundred dollars. Yeah. You know, four hundred fifty bucks. It's you know, we could, you know, pocket pocket seventy five or a hundred dollars on each gun yeah. that we built. Well, okay, that sounds like a small business to me. Yeah. You know, like how how yeah. much was a spam can on a seven six two? Oh gosh. <laughs> I remember with well, the one that I missed, the one that I missed really bad, when I was in law school, I was I was shooting as you know, was, that was one that really got into shooting was in law school as a stress reliever. And we used to go out we, just for the joy of rapid fire. We had FALs and G3s. It was battle rifles because a five five six, a poodle shooter. What are you going to do with that, son? You can't even go hunting with it. You know, <laughs> that was a, we were all about the battle rifles back then. And we used to buy these uh, Portuguese seven six two NATO. A thousand rounds was one hundred and forty bucks. <laughs> and we would take a two hundred round spam can of it. And we'd go through it in an afternoon. We'd shoot 200 rounds yeah. of 762 NATO in an afternoon between two or three guys having a great time. Just pop, 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 pop. You know, we'd bring out old radios and computer monitors <laughs> and stuff and just demolish them and then yeah. sweep it all up, you know. Um, just absolute redneckery, you know. And, and now I look at the cost of 762 NATO and I'm like, man, like I haven't shot my FAL all year. You yeah. know? <laughs> it looks cool. It's just sitting there in the closet. 
you know, it's in the safe. That's so happens, times man. times change. Well, we appreciate you coming up, dude. Yeah, appreciate it. It's gonna be fun. Yeah, yeah. Talk uh, talk about a little bit about everything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm an open book. You know how I am. <laughs> yeah, I, I love to love to talk with gun guys. So, well, on that note, uh, welcome. This is the Big Tech Ordinance Podcast. I'm Mike. We got Chris, and today we're joined with Michael from Gideon Optics uh, and. You do anything else on the side too that folks should know about? <laughs> uh, my wife and I are teaching. We're starting to teach people. Yeah, yeah. So we've got uh, we've got a little website called theguntteachers.com. dot com. She's she's a retired school teacher, twenty eight years of of teaching high school kids, and so she actually is a really good instructor. And so she knows the teaching part really well, and then uh, has worked really hard on getting her firearm skills up to her teaching skills. She took one hundred and twenty six uh, hours of of class this year wow so she she actually beat me she had 126 hours of of formal training uh just this year and, and most most of it in pistol that's fantastic but yeah she, that's she, a lot. she can flat out shoot yeah. yeah yeah and and just finished up some tom tom given stuff right that's right yeah she was she was uh top shot when we did range master nice. top shot tests she beat me out i was third oh. <laughs> mirko was second <laughs> so that's, that's fantastic yeah man. yeah she it was it was a good day so yeah, she's uh, so we're trying to we're trying to just teach people the right way from the start. There's so much need for it here in Houston. There's oh, there's so many people that are looking for looking for quality training. So we're trying to get that started up. And, but but um, that's mostly her with me sort of being in support and really Gideon. When you're in startup mode, <laughs> you know how it is. I, when you're in startup mode, there's no such thing as like regular hours. You know, I did something the other night at like 9 p.m. I had to um, fix a UPC code and, you know, put it on the sticker that goes on the side of the box and get it sent off and, you know, nine, nine thirty at night. And I'm like in Photoshop getting it all yeah. put together, yeah. you know, yeah. that's, that's how it is when you're in startup. Yeah. Oh yeah. For, and I, I don't I know it. if it, does it ever stop? I don't, yeah. I think I we're, we're still, we're still, still pit. we're still in that phase, I guess. <laughs> but there, uh, mon- yesterday morning I was sitting there and we were rolling, rolling stuff, you know, Black Friday. So oh, it, yeah. this is, this is, we're recording this on Tuesday, November 21st here. And um, I was literally up at like five o'clock in the morning, which I'd slept in. Actually, <laughs> I didn't get up at four and I'm sitting there. I'm like, OK, I have a problem and there's nobody to fix it for the next three hours. So all I can do is like look at this problem. Yeah, because I don't know. Like it was something I never encountered before yeah. and I just kind of had to roll with it and be like, OK, well, all right. Civilized people are going to be <laughs> awake. Uh, thank goodness they're on East Coast time. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Now that's when you learn to set up mental boundaries, you know, and you're like, okay, this is going to happen when it happens. It's going to be fixed when it's fixed. I can't do anything for three hours. Yeah. All right, I'm going to eat. I'm going to, you know, like do some dishes. I'm going to play an hour of Mech Warrior, whatever it is, <laughs> you know, Star Wars or whatever, and I'm going to relax and chill. And then, you know, then you then you click back in. You find a way. You you either find a way to balance it out, or you're like me and you take blood pressure meds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> at least at least you're not pounding a monster. Right? Yeah. Whew. Yeah. I uh, I I used to tell people I run on caffeine and hatred, and they all thought it was a joke. And now I've been in therapy for a couple of years, and I'm running out of hatred. So I got I got to use more caffeine. <laughs> Good for you. So so tell everybody a little bit about. Michael and what you've done. First of all, Mike or Michael? Either way. Okay. I'm not picky so, about it. So we've already talked about a little bit about your background in, in firearms in Missouri. Yeah. And building AKs and stuff. How did you trans transfer that or transfer from that type to how you got into the firearms industry? Uh, I got lucky. Also, I wouldn't take no for an answer, uh, which is I'm pretty stubborn that way. So uh, when I was lawyering, I I hated lawyering, um, and I've told so many people, don't go to law school; it's not worth it, you know. And then they never listen to me, and then they go to law school and they owe a hundred thousand dollars in student loans, and they're like, "This sucks." I'm, I told your ass, <laughs> like I, I told you. Um, but I I enjoyed the side business, the side hustle, guns gun store, and the building of AKs and the smithing on nineteen eleven. I enjoyed that so much more than I enjoyed people fighting over their kids and divorcing and bankruptcies and all of the, you know, traffic court and tickets and all the stuff that a lawyer has to deal with. You know, you're, when you're lawyering, you're dealing with people at their worst, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and that really, the, being an attorney just really ripped my guts out. And, um, 
you know, I still have damage today from that. I have like various amounts of it. It changed my worldview in unhealthy ways, you know. So I thought I really want to do the firearms thing a lot more. Like it's it it really it really hooked into me. It really it's who I am right down to my core, which we can we can talk about. I want to get into the firearms industry. So I had a really hard time. I was out of work after I after I and in 2010 I just blew up my life. I divorced my wife, shut down my side business, shut down my law firm, packed everything I owned into a little SUV and left. And it was like I'm just going to go out into the west and seek my fortune, you know, like <laughs> what am I what am I going to do? And lots of people wouldn't take me seriously because they thought, well, this guy's just mad about things right now. He's eventually going to want to go back to being a lawyer. Um, so he's, you know, they, I had a hard time convincing people I really wanted to change careers, right? I was out of work for like nine months. And then, um, honestly, cheaper than dirt is the guys who gave me my first shot. <laughs> um, a guy that I'm still friends with and respect very much, Andrew Sipian, who runs his own uh, – Anyway, he's 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 a fantastic guy. I worked for him at CTD, um, and I think it's a testament to his character that he fired me, and we're still friends. <laughs> <laughs> he had to fire me. I gave him reason, but we're still buddies oh, that's uh, good. all these years later, right? Um, so so I worked at CTD, and I learned about marketing. And I learned about how things really work, and I and I learned kind of the, I, that was my first chance of really seeing how seeing how the sausage was made, mm -hmm. and um, after CTD, I, I bounced around a lot, man. I've 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 had adventures. I I gunsmithed in Colorado for a while. That was really cool for a while, um, but I wasn't making any money at it. So I went to the oil field and I was a, a measurement while drilling operator for a couple of years, hmm. and that was really good money. But you're never home. But I didn't have a family, uh, so yeah. it, it didn't it didn't bother me to be home five days a month. Um, so you know I've and, and then. Uh, I've sold Harley Davidson motorcycles. I was a Harley salesman, you know. I've done all kinds of weird stuff, and then I uh, I wound up I wound up going to Primary Arms in mm -hmm. 2015, and uh, worked with Marshall at PA, and I still have friends there. Um, they have grown so much Massive. since I first started there. They were in little warehouses. They weren't in the big building that they are now. They're in little warehouses, and they kept having to rent out more warehouse space, and and um, I was there when they transitioned over to the building they're in now, which is like the Taj Mahal compared to where they were before. And and even since then, like, they're doing so many things right. Um, you really have to take PA seriously. Their, their stuff is just phenomenal. I know some of the people that work there, and they they do a phenomenal job. So awesome hat tip to PA, and I learned a lot there. Um, parted ways with them in 2019 and was Swamp Fox Mike from 2019 until uh, last year. Mm -hmm. So that was that was really cool. I was in on the ground level. It was something that was just getting started. And that was really my, really when I got to be the guy that I wanted to be. I really enjoyed being Swamp Fox Mike. I really enjoyed the research and development of it and, and configuring the optics and having a say. Like, I can point at something in all of these different Swamp Fox scopes and say, that was my idea. I did that, the, that throw lever on the arrowhead. Yeah. That was me. I said we should have four little screws and make it a sacrificial piece. So if you drop the arrowhead, you just break the throw lever instead of having it, like, break the actual scope. Yeah. So then we just send a guy another thro throw lever, and he thinks we have great customer service because we send him, like, a $13 throw lever instead of having an RMA, a $650 <laughs> scope, because we, we have this overbuilt throw lever, and it goes right through the magnification ring and, and, and blows up your scope. Yeah. Right? It's like... There's all these cool little stories I can tell about. I, I had this idea, I had that idea, and I love that. Um, and I really had a great time there. And Swamp Fox is still like they're still. It's like it's like having a kid, and you raise this kid, and then they eventually they move out and they go to college and stuff. And you're like, I spent the best years of my life with you, you know. Um, but they wanted me to move to Denver last year. I got a call from the boss, and he's like, hey, look, COVID's over. We're not doing this quarantine work-from-home thing anymore. The company's getting bigger. It's getting more unwieldy and hard to manage, which I respect. He wasn't wrong about that. Um, and he's like, this remote work thing, I just, I, I don't want to manage it anymore. I want everybody to move to Denver. Everybody needs to come to Denver, come together, and we'll be all under one room, all under one one roof. And, and you know, that's what we're going to do. And I was like, <laughs> because I had met this girl in Houston and married her 
<laughs> that same year, last year, we were married last February, and she's got a couple kids from a previous marriage, and they're doing great here in Houston. Yeah. And I'm like, I can't uproot these kids. Um, you know, one of them just made jazz band, and he plays three instruments in jazz band, and he's getting great grades. He's probably going to go to college, and, and, you know, he's all about his jazz friends. And, and uh, the daughter is in community college already, and she's working really hard, but she's saving a bunch of money because she lives at home and commutes to class. Yep. And I'm like, I can't rip up these kids yeah. and take them to, like, Stonerville, USA, where all the kids are stoners because all their parents move there because they're stoners. And half of my guns are technically illegal because my magazines hold more than 10 or 15 rounds but don't worry the local sheriff isn't enforcing the law so i still have my freedoms uh, uh, no no so so i we parted ways and then gideon happened so jordan jordan Vinro runs jsd supply and they um, is a very solid organization knows what he's doing he's a go-getter he's my kind of guy he's easy to work with and uh, and he said, I want to start an optics company because the president has banned by executive order the poly 80s, all the 80% stuff. He just signed, a, signed an executive order and said, you can't do that anymore. He's like, that's a, a major chunk of my business. I don't want to just throw in the towel and say, well, we're done now. You know, this is what they want. Mm -hmm. they, they want you to just give up and say, well, I guess I can't sell products now. So he's like, let's do something else that has a decent margin and isn't going to get banned. If only I could find someone that has experience building an optics brand. And there I was looking for a job. I'm going, hey, over here, pick me. Yeah. So here we are again. Now it's now it's uh, it's Gideon, and it's we've got five pistol dots that we've come out with. We've got a one power prism scope that's just about to hit like early next month, hopefully before Christmas, right? And by shot show, I hope to have LPVOs to show oh, off. Nice. I just. Yeah, I've yeah, probably been working on some yeah. well, through Facebook and stuff, but yeah. So I'm I'm excited about yeah. that. Yeah. So um, they'll have my reticles in them. So if people hate the reticles, it's on me. <laughs> so uh, I hope I hope not. They're they're a little bit edgy, but they're not super. I didn't reinvent the wheel. You know, this is, reticles are a whole. We could do. We could spend this whole podcast talking about reticles and. No one would listen because they'd all be bored to death. You, you would actually. <laughs> but I would do it though. You would. Well, that's what we're. That's <laughs> that's literally. Well, I don't think we've ever deep dived. We've deep dived into ARs mm -hmm. multiple times, oh, whether yeah. it be gas impingement or direct in, or direct impingement <laughs> or gas piston, right? So we've we've dived into that. We've dived into Taurus and revolvers and everything. We've never. I don't think we've. I don't really think done we've ever dived optics. really hardcore into optics. So here we are. Here we are, <laughs> and I'm I'm more than interested in to go because because we see like on our end right now, our big shift in the last year and a half, two years was like MOA stuff has just stopped moving for us. Really, for 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 most most everything. People are wanting a milled reticle of some sort mm -hmm. with no BDC of, and unless it's, you know, like a milled reticle yeah. and mill adjustments. I mean, that's that's the stuff that we can get that I know is going to turn around and move. Mm -hmm. And I don't know uh, if that is mostly because we have a very informed and advanced knowledge and picky. Can we say yeah. picky? <laughs> Picky is a thing. Picky, picky, particular, particular, particular is a better word than picky. Yeah. Guys, I'm not calling you picky. <laughs> I'm saying you're a connoisseur. Yes. All Stop right. being so picky. <laughs> but we we understand that. Like, yeah. that's what we've been ordering, and that's what turns around and, and and sells for us. So, let's talk optics, man. Yeah. Welcome to the Optics Podcast. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, how, how did you... Trans so you, you got hired by PA. Hired by PA, and I was, and I was hired to write their user manuals. Hmm. Um, and in fact, when I interviewed for them, I think I got the job because um, <laughs> when I interviewed them, I brought them a user manual that I made for one of the products that I already owned and was like, if I was going to do the user manual, this is how I would do it. And they're like, this guy actually brought like work product to the <laughs> job interview. That's, and that's, uh, that's, that's good. Man. <laughs> like, if I was going to do the red, the the, this is what I would do, you know. And then they're like, okay, well, we can't do this, we can't do that. We could do this, you know. And then we met in the middle. 
so yeah so i was doing their their user manuals and um and uh, Dimitri is the guy that came up with ACSS, and I had to learn uh, how the reticles. I learned how the reticles work from Dimitri, and I'm I'm sorry to say that he he um, he's mad at me. You know, Dimitri, if you're out there and you see this, uh, bro, like I want us to be friends. You know, I just I miss you, dude. Um, he's a good he's a good guy. He did all the work to make the ACSS reticle system. Um, which he owns, he owns several patents on it. It was his idea. It's a great reticle system. I'm a huge ACSS fan. It's a great reason to buy, you know, PAs is the ACSS stuff. But he feels like moving on and doing reticle work like for Gideon, for Swamp Fox and stuff. Like I'm taking what I learned from him and I'm using it to make a competitor product now. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, ah, I can see how you would feel that way. It's no, no hard feelings, but I, I will admit, I learned a lot from Dimitri on how this stuff really works, and, and, and he really instructed me quite a bit. This is, this is why the reticle should be set up this way and not. And, and there are other guys out there that I know and that I talk to. Um, uh, Ilya Koshkin, the Dark Lord of Optics, is a friend of mine, and I know Frank Plum, who did the Plum reticle. <laughs> Amazing reticle. It's like an F-16 fighter jet gun funnel <laughs> but in your scope you know like it's an incredible reticle um the hardest thing about the the plum reticle is finding a uh, a manufacturer who has the ability to actually pull it off ah. because you have this giant complex reticle with all these tiny little dots and marks in it and stuff and remember in the actual scope body it's the size of my thumbnail yeah it's like that big it's like the size of a dime and you know if you can't if we make 20 of these reticles in the factory and only one of them passes QC and we throw 19 in the trash can, that's a bad sign. It's actually why some How do you even QC that? Do you have like a big magnifying yep, glass? That... That's exactly what they do. Yeah. Oh. They have collimators and they have they have big, you know, they do all the work under under big magnifying glass and there's different ways to do it. Usually it's a, it's a chemical etch. Chemical etching is really is really cool. So it's like uh, so we have our lens so, so a reticle it's called a reticle doublet. Here we go. Here's the deep There dive. we go. There <laughs> we go. Everybody skipped this part of the podcast right here. Mark this. So we have what's called a reticle doublet in, let's say, an LPVO, right? So I have a piece of glass, and it's flat. It's not curved at all. It doesn't, doesn't change the properties of the light. The light passes straight through it. The only purpose it has is to house the reticle. So it's flat, piece of glass. And we put <laughs> – so we have a – let's call it a piece of duct tape. We have a piece of duct tape, and we cut – a shape in the duct tape. You uh. can cut it with a laser. You can cut it physically, but you cut a, basically a stencil, and you put the piece of duct tape on the glass, and then you swab it with acid, and the acid eats into everywhere where the cut was made. Yeah. So now I have a piece of glass with acid etched into it in very precise places, right? Then I take a bunch of black paint, and I swab it over my duct tape. Mm. It sinks into where the acid is, I peeled the duct tape off, and oh, wow. I have a reticle. If I have an illuminated reticle, I don't use black paint. I use silver paint, or I work on a different color of paint that reflects the color of my illumination oh. better. So we have now we have a little LED light, like you'd see in a red dot, that's hiding in the corner of of the LPVO, and it's shining light forward on that reticle. And it hits that silver, and it reflects back. It scatters that light back towards my eyes. Voila, red or green illumination, depending on what color your LD, LED is. But it's called a doublet because, obviously, <laughs> once you have this reticle done, you want to protect it. It has to be absolutely clean because um, that's going to be in focus with your little fast-focus ocular, right? Mm-hmm. So if there's any specks, if there's any grease, dirt, a hair, yeah. you're going to see that, right? It's going to fail QC. Ah, oh, there's a hair in this one. You know, goes in the trash can, right? So it has to be absolutely clean. So what they do is, while it's still in the clean room and absolutely perfect, they put another piece of glass on top of it, sandwich it, and then they glue all around the outside of that, epoxy it. So it's it's a doublet. It's two pieces of glass with the reticle. With the, with the etched yeah, with reticle. Yeah, etched reticle in the middle okay. of it. And the whole thing is like, I mean, it's it's like a, a nickel. I mean, it's so tiny, guys. And is that, uh, like, do they actually move that? So, like, when you make your adjustments for when did your right. elevation, do they just, like, move that entire piece of glass? Or? That's exactly right. Huh. Yeah. So so you have an erector assembly, which That's is a tube said. inside a tube. And um, so, so you see big pieces of glass on the outside of the scope. 
the part uh, that the light is actually going through on the inside is it's smaller than that. And we have we have a tube. I wish now I wish I had an LPVL. I should have brought one with me. <laughs> so we have a windage and elevation turret here, right? And you have in most LPVOs now. So we've got elevation on top, windage on the side, and down in the corner you have this strange little button that that's been installed with some kind of a weird proprietary tool. And I'll even try to put in the user manual. Don't pull Don't that thing this. out. <laughs> Don't leave it. Leave it alone because people will be like, what's that do? You know, and they think, oh, that's where the battery is or whatever. You know, like like they'll try to mess with that. That little button piece there is holding in a very powerful spring. Mm. And the spring tensions the erector assembly on the inside of the scope. So when you when you do your adjustments, you're basically screwing in. Think of it as a screw in and out. As I As I poke my top screw down... I push the erector down, and it pushes my reticle doublet down, which means I then, in order to get a sight picture, have to bring my rifle up, and my sight and the bullet, my, goes, up. And the bullet <laughs> goes up. Right? It's that simple. It's just, it, and it's one of those things where it's like a, it's like a fighter jet. Like, it's, you know, in in principle. It's easy. You've got a guy with a control stick sitting in a cockpit, and you got an engine that sucks air in one end and blows it out the other, and you got some bombs hanging off the wings, and how hard could it be? And then, like, you actually look into what it takes to make it, and it's frankly incredible that, like, a Strike Eagle 1-6 to six is, a, is a $300 item. I mean, it's nuts yeah. that, they're, that they're that cheap because the, the amount of work that it takes to make these things and, and make them consistent and make them work every time, it's, it's insane. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of like I say about the food industry, everybody, everybody asks, why is food so expensive? The harder question that we don't really want to ask is what exactly are they doing to keep cheap food so cheap? Yeah. Like what is in those Costco $1 hot dogs at this stage? Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's delicious. I, they're probably losing money on the $1 hot dogs yeah. at this point. Yeah. Along with their chicken. That's so cool that that is... You know, you've all, I've always heard the term etch reticle. Yeah. I never thought about like how, how they was, actually did it. How it was what's etched, doing the etching. What's yeah. doing yeah. the etching and like the silver or the reflectiveness of that to like I never thought about the illuminated reticle no, part of it. No. And like Vortex is one to six. Is that the reticle re- the same way? The, the red the, dot? The, the razor? Yeah, the ra- the razor. Ooh, the razor. Mm. Be still my beating heart. Um, I love the razor one to ten. If you're shopping for me for Christmas, I'm a size razor one to ten. And they're in uh, stock right now at BTO. All it takes is money. Um, <laughs> <laughs> stop being poor. Uh, we need to have the stop being poor conversation too, because that and then you'll really learn about who I am. Um, that is called diffractive reticle illumination. It is, so there's really three types. There is what uh, what Gideon will be using, um, which is which is uh, an etched reticle illumination. That's what I'm familiar with from Swamp Fox. It's what you mostly see from from primary arms. Um, it is it is affordable. It is effective. Um, it's repeatable, um, and it's what I would call daylight visible, right? So I can see that it's the reticle's red instead of you know instead of black. I can I can tell. In daylight, but it's not what we would call daylight bright, right? right? Yeah. Then you have what I call the light pipe, which is a fiber optic reticle illumination, which is like your Steiner PX4 eyes mm. and your Trichicon ACOG. Um, ACOG's a great example. So you basically have a, a fiber optic that's running up the right side of the ACOG, right? And it gets piped into the middle of the scope, and there's a little, there's a little fiber optic, like you would have fiber optic uh, internet, same thing. It's a light pipe, and it's pointed right at your eye, so it's a little bit brighter. But you only you can't illuminate like a whole reticle with all the little stadias and the yeah. BDC and all that stuff. All you get is one little like one MOA red <laughs> dot in the middle because it's literally the diameter of that fiber optic, and it but it's pointed right at your eye instead of reflecting off of an LED. So it's a little bit brighter, a little bit harder to pull off, a little bit more expensive. But it's a little bit brighter, and you'll you'll notice sometimes, uh, like in LPVOs, like the Steiner uh, is a good example. Um, the loophole fire dot 
is yep. a good example. They'll have like a big, thick stadia coming up from the bottom, like a German Plex number four. You know, the, you know the old school. It's like a big, a big, tall stadia coming up from the bottom. It's to hide that fiber optic. You okay. have the dot sitting on top. It's so you can't see the fiber optic that's hiding behind the reticle. Okay. Ah. Yeah. Isn't that cool? Yeah. So, and then every, every once in a while, you'll see pictures on the internet. Some guy like, "Hey, I dropped my scope and my and my my illumination's all cattywampus," and you'll see it all of. It'll have moved. Ah. It'll all be off to the right or something, and you'll just see a little bit of that that fiber optic in there. So that's the second one, and then diffractive is like the nuclear bright. Oh my gosh, this is amazing! But it's in a two thousand dollars scope. Yeah. Uh, Night Force Attacker has diffractive. The Razors have diffractive. It is the best. But um, I probably eh, you know what? Nobody said I couldn't say this. I'm not a, I'm not under NDA on this. <laughs> it's only made in Switzerland. Hmm. It's only made in Switzerland by a Swiss company. And I was I was trying to get them to put that illumination in the Swamp Fox Warhorse, which was our first focal plane one to ten we were working on. They actually just came out with it in a one to six. So Swamp mm-hmm. Fox has a one as a first focal plane one to six. I haven't got to look through one yet, but I I've got my fingers crossed. They did a good job with it. I, I did some work on on that project. And I wanted that diffractive reticle illumination so bad. Everybody wants that that daylight bright, right? Yeah. And it died on the vine. It didn't happen. And I never got a straight answer to why, but I think that's where politics comes in, where these are China-made scopes, mm. not made in Taiwan, made in the People's Republic of China by really good people, I will, I will add. That's another thing I can rant to you about. Um, but I think the Swiss took a look at their expensive diffractive reticle illumination and looked at what it would take to get it sent to China in bulk and we're like, yeah, we can't. Like, they're not going to let us do that. Yeah, yeah. you know, because like we have ITAR, but we're not the only country that restricts, you know, import and exportation of firearms technology. They just, I don't think they wanted that tech getting in the hands of, of the PRC, and so yeah. it never, it never happened. I was like, well, I tried, you know. Yeah. But those reticles by themselves, the diffractive reticles, talk about it's in a two thousand dollar scope. If you buy them in bulk like a lot of them at once, <laughs> then they cost about as much as a strike eagle for the reticle by itself. Wow. Yeah. So if you're looking for a $300 daylight bright uh, diffractive reticle LPVO, keep dreaming. How does that reticle, yeah. how, was, how does diffractive work? Man, I don't even, I, they, I've, <laughs> I've got a brochure that I got. I've talked to them at SHOT Show. And it's, um, the, the, the diffractive is, um, whew, it's crazy. It it is a lot of glass, and it's actually um, like a laminate inside the glass. And the glass is like there's pieces of glass that are focusing the light. I, I, it's way over my head. I'm not an optical engineer. There's a tiny look, little gnome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's a tiny little there's there's a flashlight. <laughs> yeah, there's a tiny little gnome in there, and we sent him to Chernobyl, and now he glows. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they explained it to me, and I was like, "Whoa, I can see why that's so expensive." Yeah, like it's it's really amazing tech, but it's it's next gen stuff. It's like the F thirty five, you know, stealth fighter of of LPVO illumination. It's amazing, but you will you'll have to pay. Oh yeah, it's pricey. Yeah, you'll have to it's pay. It's pricey, and you gotta be really wanting that specific daylight brightness. Like I've got a. a EOTech one to ten mm-hmm. on my my little FCD build, and I was I, a couple weekends ago. I was out hunting, and I did not turn on the reticle until it started to get a little bit dark outside. That's I was like, why. Okay, I'm... do do do. All right, perfect. In daytime, I just run them in black anyway. Just black. So uh, I'm not super pink. And like <laughs> you know, I, I say I can't really be that much of a snob on this because you can you can put you know a five thousand dollar amazing precision optic and you know tangent theta or something like that you know one of those boutique put a five thousand dollar 25 power scope in front of me you know what the last thing the light's going to hit before it hits my eyes i'm going to go through that five thousand dollar scope it's going to hit these two hundred dollar glasses <laughs> that are all scratched up that are dirty right now and they've got specs on them yeah yeah so i'm i'm not really sure like how much i need to spend the five thousand dollars on the because my eyeballs are not not worthy of it, you know. Really, <laughs> honestly, we need so. to get you some. Uh, we need to get him a, 
what is it? Where are they? Oh, oh the spuds. spuds. Yeah. yeah. We'll get you a spud before you leave. Throw it in your pocket. Oh, microfiber cloth. Oh, microfiber. One of our best-selling products, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Super cheap, and it's awesome. I think my girls all have. Oh, yeah. I got, like, probably 50 yeah. of them. <laughs> yeah. Sounds great. I'm in. Yeah, we'll get you one before you leave here. That way yeah. you run around with it. Maybe you can sneak it in on a Gideon video. Absolutely. Just have it on the table. Absolutely. <laughs> I love doing that stuff. I'll be at SHOT Show and be like, hey, I love, are you guys going to shot? Oh yeah, yep. yeah. I I like it. I'm. Uh, you get guys that are in the industry and they're like, oh, I can't believe it's shot show again. I hate it so much. I'm like, it's a week in Vegas. What's wrong with you? Yeah, come on. Oh, I look forward yeah. to it every year. It's it's a great time. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to going. I, I don't have to work year. a booth, so like that's yeah. probably a big part of it. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. So more more into the optics, Dean. Yeah. So we we've went into the 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 magic behind the reticles and, and LPVOs and stuff. What about red dots? Like what are we seeing or what are you like, do we want to talk about how a red dot works? Yeah, that's yeah, easy. That's, that's easy. I can do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> ask me the questions. I'm not afraid. Monty Python reference. Um, everyone's like, Oh my God, he's so old. He's making Monty Python jokes. Um, so, yeah, so uh, what's amazing to me is how old Red Dot Tech is. They have the basics of Red Dot Tech in World War I. They did. Um, and and uh, the the ultimate Red Dot, I think, the ultimate Red Dot was the gun sight they had in the F-86 fighter jet in the Korean War. It was a range computing basic radar, and it was... Basically, what you see on like an open emitter red dot today, you had a pane of glass sitting in front of this guy's eyes with a light shining on it, and it was coated, and the light bounced off of the pane of glass and went to the guy's, the pilot's eyes, and wherever that little dot was is where six fifty caliber machine guns were going <laughs> to shoot, you know, back before guided missiles were invented, and... Uh, the amazing part of it was that there was a ring in the F-86, and the ring would shrink and grow depending on what the there was bouncing back from the target. And it was basically, once the ring was the same width as the wings of the enemy plane, that's when you started to shoot because you they, they had it all lined up. It was amazing stuff for, like, being <laughs> developed post-World War II in, like, the late 1940s. They were yeah, working on this yeah. stuff. And, you know, they, they had that you know, back when, you know, my granddad wasn't even my age. They were doing that. Um, and then... Like the history of it, I I also think the the red dot on rifles or on personally owned firearms, like like not in fighter jets and stuff. The red dot was basically born in the 1973 Sante raid because they're yep. raiding the prison camp at Sante. Um, Bull Simon and and all those guys. I mean, amazing. If you guys haven't read about the Sante raid in '73 do it it's it's incredible like the stuff that they did was so gutsy like hey i'm not sure if we can get inside the camp in time to save all of the prisoners of war i know we'll deliberately crash a helicopter in the middle of the compound so we can get inside the compound from the beginning and then once that helicopter is destroyed we'll all pull out of it uh, the helicopter that crashed we'll raid the camp from the inside and the outside at the same time and then we'll get in the rest of the helicopters that still work and get out <laughs> Like that was the plan, that that was the part they did on purpose, <laughs> right? So and they know they're doing this at night, so they're getting ready, they're gearing up, they're training for it, and they're like, we got a problem, iron sights on machine guns at night, suck, mm -hmm. it's no good, and we're raiding we're raiding a camp full of prisoners of war that we're trying to rescue, so you can't just rattle off a belt of a hundred rounds through a M60 into the into the camp and you know not care they needed accountability for their rounds so they're running with old school car 15s and um i can't remember who thought of it but somebody saw the old uh, occluded optic occluded eye gun sight oegs uh they were in a hunting magazine and it was advertised as like for hunters that couldn't see their sights anymore at dawn and dusk here's basically a fiber optic tube that you can strap on top of your shotgun and it'll give you something to aim with and thought, well, we could try that. So they bought 50 of these or whatever and had them shipped straight to Vietnam from California, where the company was based, I think. And they hose clamped them to the top of their car 15s. They <laughs> made mounts and they just took like automotive hose clamp like you'd put on a radiator hose. 
clamped into the top of car 15s. And then they were like, wow, this is great. Now we've gone from like a 20% hit rate at night to like a 70% hit rate at night. We're hitting seven out of every 10 shots at 50 yards. This is awesome, <laughs> right? I mean, like the expectations have changed over time, oh, right? Yeah. You know, now we've got night vision and and IR. And, you know, if you if you miss at 50 yards, you're a loser now. They were, they were trying to get hits at 50 yards back then. So they basically invented that concept for the Sante raid. You couldn't even see through those old scopes. You had to keep both eyes open and your brain sort of bindens it together and, and does the math and you you have sort of a... If you ever get to shoot one, do it. They're really cool. You can sort of have a, a red glowing thing in one of your eyes' field of vision and you just have to roll with it. It's yeah, not yeah. perfect, right? But it's better than better than following tracers. You know? <laughs> so that was the birth, what I consider to be the birth of the of the red dot on, on, on rifles. And then for pistols, pistol dots really came about in competition where guys were taking... Big old honking, what what should have been rifle red dots, and they were putting them on like the old school twenty elevens, yep. the STIs and SVIs, you know. And they would they would put it on a not a reciprocating mount at all, but just a mount that clamped to the left side of the yeah. of the frame. And they'd have this giant like old school aim point, you know, M three on there, but it worked and it was faster and and it was better for like the. The desire was there, like the advantages were there. Even oh, in yeah. even in 1990s, it was it was there. And then we just we keep moving forward with miniaturizing it, getting it smaller and smaller and lighter and tougher. And every year, there's more, you know, there's more innovation and there's there's new ideas. Now it's now we've kind of come back to the enclosed emitter thing, yep. right? It used to be an enclosed emitter on a pistol was bigger than the pistol. It's a giant, huge thing, right? Yeah. And now people are like, well, I want an enclosed emitter. Well, okay, but we can we can do that now and have it be pretty much the same size as an RMR. Yeah. That's cool. I mean, it looks funky. It looks like a toaster sitting on your gun. They're not the prettiest thing ever, but I think the enclosed emitter is the way of the future. That's yeah. In another five years, they're all going to be enclosed emitter, I bet. So we'll, there's we'll, so much we'll easier mark to keep it down. We'll yeah, mark right. it down. We'll, we'll revisit this podcast. I'll put it on the calendar. <laughs> yeah, check, <laughs> check out. Was check Mike out. Right? See, was Mike right? Yeah, and like we'll do a podcast on this in five years. We'll yeah. put it on the calendar right now. But you know, we were. I was talking to uh, uh, one of our buddies that does our internet and stuff here, and I, he's a, was an instructor with me back in the day. Uh, this morning about some of the the hollow sun stuff, and he's like, we were talking about one of the new hollow suns offering. And I was like, well, you know what the problem is. with and he's like, what? I was like, the dude that bought the 509T three years ago and put it on his Glock 19 loves it, and he's happy with it. And just because they've came out with a new one, he's like, I really don't need to upgrade because this thing's doing a fantastic job. Yeah, and they're coming out with really cool new models, but I have no reason to upgrade if it's still – I pull it out – it's and the red there. dot's on, and I change the battery when I need to change the battery, and the red dot's still on, and I'm not having any issues out of it. And so I have no reason to upgrade when it works good. And that, that's, that, that's what I call an excuse to get a new gun. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it sucks from – well, it, it sucks from a retail point of view because I can't sell the new one because somebody's looking at it like, hey, I'd really like that, but my 509T works yeah, freaking awesome, and I haven't bought a new gun yet. <laughs> you know, I'm like, okay, well, let me sell you the new gun to go. Yeah, yeah there you go. Yep, sell yep. both. <laughs> yeah, it's like, like I'm not a Glock guy, and I'm like, you know, like I'm like, Glocks are okay. I shoot them okay. They're fine. They go bang. I, I carry one. You know, it, it hits where I want to hit, but I just don't get passionate about Glocks like some people do. Yeah, and I'm like. We got like eight of these things in the house. <laughs> I don't even like Glocks that much. Why do, that's like they're they're like roaches. They just grew, they just showed up. You know, there's a bunch of them now. All of a sudden, yeah. Yeah. you know, they're affordable. And there's another one that came out. And I got to put a scope on this one. And you know, I've got optics on all, almost all of them. Um, so yeah, it's 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 funny how that works. It's, uh, you always there, man. So yeah, the funny thing about the technology of it is. It's moving so fast. That's the really scary part. And, uh, you know, I think it's no secret that the, the brand name does not matter as much as it used to. It's more like the time. It's more like how recent the product came out. So a Gideon that came out last year, 
holds up really, really well to a loophole from five years ago. It's just the truth. Is our brand name as good as Loophole? Heck no. Everybody knows who Loophole is. Almost nobody knows who Gideon is, right? So, but the 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 Loophole Delta Point Pro. I, I don't I don't want to show, throw shade at Loophole, but it hasn't been updated in a while, right? I'm sure they're working on something. They'll come out with something. It'll be a shot show. It'll be cool. Trigicon recently came out with some really nice stuff. Yeah. If you want to pay more than your Glock cost to put an optic <laughs> on it, please feel free and go ahead. Um, you know, but like the reason why the new Trigicon stuff is totally awesome is not just because it says Trigicon, but because they've packed in new features, taking advantage of everything that we've learned and done. And the, 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 the iteration of it and the moving forward in the entire industry is really almost terrifying. So that's what a lot of people just, I, this is where I thought of this because you're talking about people that are used to their old stuff, you know? And I've seen, when I saw this at Swamp Fox before, where we had LPVOs, we had precision scopes, and guys would have like a $900 loop hold, and they'd buy our $400 scope and go, well, this is better than my $900 loop hold. And I'm like, it doesn't mean that loop hold sucks. It means that your $900 loop hold was $900 in 1988, yeah. <laughs> right? And it's worked this whole time. Okay, you got your money's worth, bro. It's worked for decades, right? But we've learned more about the science of the shape of the lenses and the coatings and their mathematical relationship to each other. So instead of having a 3 to 9 loophole for $800, I can get you a 2 to 12. It's got a 3 to 9 already built into it. It goes from 2 <laughs> to 3 <laughs> to 9 to 12, right? It's, it's, it's more in both yep. directions. And it costs less. And the glass is better. And there's more. And there's and features there, yeah there's more it's got locking turrets and and you know illumination and all this other stuff it doesn't mean the loophole was a bad deal it was what was available right and and so time marches on right so that's that's sometimes a hard pill for people to swallow they get really invested in uh you know this is what my grandpa had and he gave it to my uncle and now i've got it and you know that's that's uh that's m1a guy you know, like, yeah. like every guy that I know that loves the M1A loves it for like a sentimental reason and not because it's the best battle rifle. Yeah. <laughs> they never just say it's because it's the best rifle. It's because my uncle had one when he was in the Marine Corps and then he came back and he got the civilian version and then we, he gave it to me. We just lost two subscribers. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fuck your God. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's objectively a good rifle is never the, the right answer. Um, but yeah, so the, the as time marches on. Yeah. No matter what brand you go with, almost there are still trashy brands. There's there's fifty dollar crap on eBay. Um, you're right. You can you can you can do that too. But um, I'm a value guy, right? I like to say there are three kinds of buyers. There's the guy who brags about how little he paid. There's the guy who brags about how much he paid. I knew a guy once when I was gunsmithing in Colorado who bought a Scar 17 and kept the receipt in the in the storage of the gun <laughs> so he could pull it out and show how much he paid people for it. Oh, that's insane. Yeah. Talk about just flopping it out on the table in front of everybody, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Look how much I paid for this. I wiped my butt with $3,000. How about you, pal? <laughs> right? Um, there's that guy. And then there's me, which is sometimes I pay a little bit. Sometimes I pay a lot. But I want the most value per dollar that I can possibly get when I buy something. That's my core customer. That's the Gideon core customer. And that's who I am. So... It's easy for me to sell that because that's what appeals to me, yep. right? If you're that guy and you want value for your money, we're in a golden age of firearms right now. Oh, my gosh. Buy while you can. Buy red dots. Buy scopes. Buy rifles. Get seven ARs. Do it. Because um, the value right now, what you can get for your money is really extraordinary. You guys know I'm right. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They're fan I mean, just... In the last three years since, well, almost four years that I've now worked with you, um, the the difference in, I mean, there's so much difference in the optics, yeah. you know? Like, oh, what could we get, you know, a 1 to 10, you know, Razor 1 to 10 was, is, I mean, still is a fantastic scope. But, I mean, that, if you, you were going to be paying for it. Mm -hmm. You're going to be paying yeah. attack R prices or Razor 1 to 10 prices if you wanted a good one to ten yeah. now there are other options that have just as many if not more features 
on some of that stuff. Or look how many SKUs Hollison has now. Like when you started, how many? How many? Oh yeah. How big was the Hollison oh, product oh, catalog? Yeah. Oh yeah. Now it's like I mean, there are so many different models and like footprints and you know. Uh, Options. Form form factor sizes and everything, you know, it's, it's reticles. It's crazy. Yeah, the, the, yeah, uh, like this one this one has five, and this one has four. This one has one. This yeah. one, this one's price different, and this one went on sale because it was looked so much like the other one. <laughs> whoopsie! Somebody got a really good deal yesterday. Oh no! Uh, yeah, we got a pricing, whoopsie. Yeah, pricing error. Yeah, oh. Pri- little pricing error, but they got some good optics. So hopefully they they yeah, appreciate good optics, it. Good deal. Hopefully they <laughs> good deal. Uh, hopefully, hopefully they come back and like you know what? I'm, shit. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> buy something at retail from BTO <laughs> just to just to <laughs> just please come back. Make a deposit got, in the Karma Bank. You if, know, if you go to MGRS yesterday, <laughs> look, just come back and buy yeah. something at full price, please. But <laughs> but there's some there's yeah. some killer options there's some killer features and you know i go back and you look at our customer service not a lot of stuff comes back does not working we used to have the issue and you can go in to tell them probably tell us why it's to it we'd ship out a hollow sun and they they get it and they look at it and be like oh this front the front lens it's tilted. It's yeah. tilted. Ah, no. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> never heard that one, dude. I wish I, I wish I had my manual for um, I wish I had my manual for for a Gideon optic in the in the Gideons that I, I wrote the manuals for them. Page it, one. Page one. <laughs> it literally says like, wait, my lens is tilted. Like that's that's what I put in there. Wait, my lens is tilted. No, it's supposed to be that way. So um, so you want to know how they make the lenses? I find this is this is fascinating. Okay, this is fascinating. yeah, this is this is what we're here. So, we're nerding out on, on yeah, optics. Yeah, so they start on a on a on an open emitter red dot. They start with a glass ball. It's a ball of glass. Uh, you know, like you've seen you've seen on you know and on the internet on YouTube or TikTok or whatever the the glass blowing videos where they blow these 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 perfectly circular glass balls. That's what you start with, and um, and the diameter of the ball um, determines the shape, uh, or the or the, the the radius or whatever of your of your lens. So it's mm-hmm. slightly different, but but they're all. If you if you take any of these lenses and you just continue that curve around, it'll eventually become a full circle, right? Oh wow! And it becomes a, a round ball. So they they start with a round ball, and then they basically cut some windows out of it. In each window, they maybe do three or four on the top hemisphere of the ball, and three or four at the bottom. And each one of those little cuts becomes a red dot window. <laughs> so out of each glass ball, you get multiple red dot windows because um, you're cutting sections out of it. And then the rest of it, they recycle and they melt it down. Smash and it down, do it, yeah. yeah. do it all again, right? Um, so that's where the curve comes from. But that is that is what allows the magic of not needing an eye box or an eye relief. That's the magic of red dots because, like, I've got astigmatism. So I I never see just a, like a plain three MOA dot. I see like a bow tie or yeah. a comet with a little tail or whatever. So I like those one X prism scopes quite a lot. So mm-hmm. I'm excited we got a new one coming out soon. Um, the the reticle in it's so freaking cool. <laughs> 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 it's no BDC. No, it's a big bold and in your face. It's a big honking triangle with a ring around it, and it's just like right in your face. It's gonna be crazy fast, right? But even the one X prisms, they have an eye box. Where I, you know I can't look over here and the and the dots sort of in the corner and still take a shot and make my hit right. Um, the red dots can do that because of the shape of those lenses, and we're just basically bouncing a dot of light off of that lens, and it reflects back, and that's the magic of it. Wherever I, if I can see that dot, it doesn't have to be in the middle. This happens a lot with teaching pistol shooters, yep. you know, that you see them kind of overconfirm their sights and they're driving the dot to the middle of the window every time. I'm like, you know, you could be a little bit faster. As soon as the dot sweeps over the middle, that A zone that you want to hit, think of it as a paintbrush. Don't wait for it to be a still dot. As soon as that paintbrush swipes over the middle of the target, break your shot. Pop, 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 pop. And then all of a sudden they pick up speed and they're like, wow, I'm still hitting, you know. That's the magic of, 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 of red dots. Um, you can tell I love this stuff. <laughs> yeah. Right. But yeah, that's what that's what makes that possible. Uh, and on adjustment on that, when you're adjusting the zero, all right, you're adjusting zeroing. the position of the emitter. Yeah. Okay. You're the moving the emitter around. Yeah. And you got these tiny, tiny little 
Little Adjust. gnomes in there. Yeah. Again. Little gnomes. And, yeah, little gnomes, right? Um, now I'm going to see Mike as a right? gnome in my hot hey, link. And shameless, shameless plug for Gideon. I got I got to get in a shameless plug for my product. Um, a big selling point for us is that we actually have in all of our in all of our optics we have one MOA per click click adjustments in mm. like an RMSC size pistol sight where it's on like a like a Smith and Wesson shield or a Sig P365 a tiny tiny little red dot and we still manage to get in clicks instead of just a tension turret where it's marked yeah. and you kind of have to, yeah, kinda you kind of guess and you kind of you know like like just it's sort of trial and error you know we actually have a, a one MOA per click in there, which for a two hundred and thirty dollar red dot is pretty freaking fantastic. Yeah. That's what's, another thing that was impossible five years ago. Nobody had that. What's clicking? If it's if a if detent, it's just detent. a detent. It's a little detent on it's a little detent on a spring in there, and it just goes boop boop boop. It's mushy, you know. It's not as nice as like a big honking precision turret, right? Yeah. But it's you've got a tiny little screwdriver that you're that you're putting in there. Also, I I like screwdriver adjustments, and I like Torx head fasteners. Get out of here with those Allen heads. They strip out way too yeah, easy. Yeah. And I hate trying to make adjustments with an Allen head wrench. Because if I strip that out, if I get to the end of my travel or whatever, and then I strip it out, yeah. now I'm screwed. You know, like, now what are you going to do? The thing's all the way to the right or whatever, and you can't bring it back because you stripped out your Allen head. So I like, give me a regular type screwdriver for my adjustments and give me clicks. And then on on my my fasteners, I want a Torx head. I don't want to strip out an Allen and have, and then I got to send it to a gunsmith and have them drill it out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we like Torx. Yeah, yeah. yeah. big Torx fan. Torx is the way. Yeah, definitely the way. So Especially yeah, it's funny how stuff. you you. It's funny how uh, you get into this and you start having weirdo opinions about stuff like, oh, I don't really care about like Leupold versus Trigicon. I care about Torx versus Allen head. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that weird? <laughs> And if the gnomes actually make clicking sounds, right? Yeah, got to keep the gnomes like happy. Click, click, click. 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 Yeah, he's yeah, down there. It's, it's just click. That's all I want, man. Like, because I hate it when you're like, "Was that? Was that? Was that a click? Was that a move? Did we move? Yeah. Okay, we moved. Did we move that time? No, we moved. Okay, big bold adjustment. Okay, yeah. we moved now. Yeah, let's back her up. Yeah, and if you're trying to like, I I zero my pistol dots as far out as I can shoot a group that I can use to base a zero on, right? Yeah. So, like, if that's not a very accurate gun, I might just do 10 or 15 yards, and I'm like, eh, I'm shooting like that. I, uh, It's going to be good enough. If it's, like, a really, really accurate gun, I'll, I'll zero that sucker out at 25 yards if I can. Yeah. But when you get out there, it's so easy to over-adjust. Oh, my gosh. If you don't have the clicks, it's so easy to just you turn it a little bit, and then you're like, whoop, I'm way off. I'm like, oh, i got to put it back where it was. Like, you have to learn how to do just a smidge. Yep. The clicks make smidges easier. Yeah, absolutely. We've got MOA, we've got MRAD, we've got BDC, and we've got smidge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, I, I, I love what I do. Um, you let can me tell. Get, let, me get on, let me get on a soapbox here. While I've, while I've got your, your hundreds of viewers, thousands <laughs> of viewers, tens of thousands of viewers, 35 viewers. Thanks, Mom. Um let me just talk. my mom sitting there at YouTube just watching this. <laughs> yeah, all right. Thanks, Mom. Um, I, what I'm doing with Gideon and what I did with Swamp Fox, I, it's a dream job for me. It cuts right to the very core of who I am. And let me, let me get serious with you guys for a minute here. If I had one thing that I could say to the whole of YouTube and the whole of the firearms world, this is my message for everybody. Knock it off with the stop being poor stuff drives me crazy we need everybody to buy into the second amendment the second amendment in this country applies to every one of us because this is why i was a second amendment guy even when i was in law school we did all these law school classes about all of our all of our constitutional rights all of them let me tell you something about constitutional rights they're great we're really lucky that we've got them all you can only exercise them if you're alive if I'm dead, my freedom of speech doesn't matter a whole lot, does it? I have to stay alive in order to enjoy my constitutional rights and use any of them, right? Which means I'm my own first responder. My wife is her own first responder, right? We have to keep ourselves alive. If you can't be safe out there, be the most dangerous guy in the room. We can't make the world safe. We can't pass another law and magically... It's going to make the world safe. Don't work that way. You have to train 
and practice and be the most dangerous person in the room and keep everybody else alive when things go wrong. That, I believe. That's right who I am. And so when people say, if you can't afford a $3,000 rifle and a $2,000 scope and a $250 mount, if you can't afford you know, a top-of-the-line SIG Legion you know, with a Trigicon $700 optic on top, well, just go back home and keep a baseball bat under your bed. Practice throwing some ninja stars at the bad guys, right? That makes me mad. You've denied that person their right to live by being a snob. Every blue-collar guy who's working for the weekend and has a couple of kids that he's trying to figure out how he's going to pay for their college, right? And all he wants to do is, is go to a local match and poke holes in cardboard or ring steel, right? And all he can afford is a Taurus G3 with a $200 Gideon optic on it. You know what? I, I am that guy's company. I'm that guy's advocate. Go out and train with that Taurus. Go learn your gun. Take classes. Spend your money on doing that. A guy, a guy with a budget gun, a guy with a, a, a basic Glock 19 and a Chinese-made red dot who has taken classes and who carries every day and it's part of his lifestyle and he understands the weight of the decision he's made, I'll take that guy in a fight any day over guys with a bunch of stuff in their closet that they never practice with and they just put in, put pictures on Instagram. Yeah. Mm -mm. All I day. know which guy I'm choosing, right? And the other thing is is that if we can attract more and more Americans of different socioeconomic status, different races, religions, creeds, my wife and I in Houston, we teach a lot of minorities. We teach a lot of African Americans how to shoot. You know why? Because they know what it's like to call the cops and have them not show up. Maybe they'll send a guy in 45 minutes to fill out a form. Those people know what it's like to have to defend themselves, right? They're Americans, and they deserve a Second Amendment. So if I can be part of that by, by designing, building, QCing as best I can, marketing, and being part of a, of a company that, that can give them a product that works, that's the best job ever for me. That's right who I am because they're going to vote pro-gun. They're not going to vote for the politician that's a gun grabber and says, oh, you don't need, you don't need a 15-round magazine. They're not going to vote for that guy. And that means the Second Amendment continues on for our kids and our grandkids because if we do the stop being poor thing and only the rich people can play, it becomes a rich guy's game. Then it's like the guys who are shooting skeet and trap, you know, the clays and the membership is $2,000 a month. And there, there's only a few of them. It's yeah. not that many. And it's not enough to get a majority vote and keep the politicians, you know, out of our, out of our gun safes. So to me, working for Gideon and selling $230 Chinese made red dots to me I'm saving the second amendment and I'll tell that straight to your face I believe that stuff um, because I'm giving everyone an opportunity to partake in our lifestyle and to understand what rights they have as an American that almost nobody else in the world has almost nobody else has the ability to defend themselves I just put on Facebook yesterday a documentary about people in Taiwan that are training their preppers in Taiwan that are training for the Chinese invasion mm -hmm. with airsoft it's, they still have no Second Amendment in Taiwan. They can't own a twenty two rimfire pistol in Taiwan. And the Chinese are breathing down their necks. Like, yeah. Guys, wake up. So they're out there with clones of their of their service rifle shooting airsoft in basements and stuff. And it's like this whole cultural movement because, well, when the time comes, there'll probably be some ARs lying around. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I mean, imagine that. Imagine th that's their reality, guys. Yeah. yeah. That's the reality they're in right now. So we have it good. We got to protect it. Yeah, I, and I'll you know from a from a not to get not to get into my socioeconomic <laughs> governmental <laughs> viewpoint. Everything here. Uh, I think we'd find some much. things to agree on. Probably. Yeah, oh yeah, we definitely do. <laughs> it you, you shouldn't be discouraging somebody who's getting in it. Oh, you know, you yeah. shouldn't, because we all started somewhere. Oh, dude, if if you knew the stuff like, I started with, oh, when like, I, oh my god! Like I can remember, <laughs> I can. Rem I'm I'm going. This is. <laughs> 
Chris Greenfield telling on himself here. I can remember looking, and this is 2003, 2004 oh, you're time a baby. frame. You're a baby. This is looking at like a Ruger. I was like, oh, yeah, Rugers, they make great pistols. And like, a, I forget what it was, but it was an obnoxious <laughs> 45 ginormous i was like i that's what i want to be that's what i want to get yeah. that's that's my first pistol and i didn't i ended up going a different route i didn't get a pistol and then my first pistol i ever bought which was a pretty good pretty good pistol i believe was a, a pretty good choice m p 45 with a thumb safety oh you're a because baby i did not i am i didn't i got into pistols way way late because I, I was like i need a, i need a thumb safety I absolutely have to have a thumb safe on my pistol. That the Glocks are dangerous. And I was shooting. Did you ever shoot at the Big Piney yeah. Sportsman's Club? Yeah. All I'm right. Big Piney. So I was shooting at like a random, not a, a USPSA match whatsoever. Yeah. It was the, the the club's match. The only yeah. USPSA Local item there match. was yeah. the target. Yeah. That was the only <laughs> USP. And I went through and I shot it with my non-dotted M&P and everything. And there's a dude sitting there that was a little bit. He was switched on. He's like, Chris, you should really try shooting that, Matt. Try shooting that with my Glock 19. Try Here's that. I went through. My time was better. My hits were better. Everything was better. I was like, I guess I'm buying the Glock 19. And that's that's where my journey was. But, like, <laughs> I wasn't – nobody discouraged me from buying that Ruger. Yeah. And I could have started there. Mm-hmm. And if you discourage somebody – when they're trying to start, I mean, like recommend stuff, show them some different options, but don't discourage somebody unless they're going to make a totally unsafe yeah. decision. You know, like one of the things that I learned this year taking an instructor classes actually is don't don't discourage people when you're teaching, when you're, when oh, you're yeah. shooting. My wife's better at this than I am. Um, but but if I say if I say stop jerking the trigger, what's the last thing you heard? Jerking the trigger. Yeah. What are you probably going to do? Jerk the trigger. So instead of saying, stop jerking the trigger, I didn't tell you what to do. I told you what to not do. Yeah. Instead, I'll say, hat tip to Tim Chandler and Ashton Ray on this, 360 performance, row your oar. It's like rowing an oar. Smooth. All right, I'm shooting slow. I'm rowing my oar smoothly. When I decide to shoot fast, do I slap the oar against the water? Does that help? No? I do the exact same thing. I just do it faster. Yep. All right? Row your oar. Row it the same way every time. So now I didn't tell you not to do something I don't want you to do. I told you how to do something I want you to do. And then people, ding, light bulb goes on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah right? Yeah. Little little stuff yeah. like that. Just being positive in how you address students. Now if I could only be positive myself. Ugh, yeah. That was, golly gee. Yeah. I, I used to lay out on the gun counter. Uh, you probably did the same thing when you were working the gun counter at spring. Mm-hmm. You know, like we, I – the rental counter we'd have somebody come up and i'd be like all right here you go and i would lay like five choices oh yeah on the counter that were all solid and they're like well what's the why is that one still down there i was like well let's not talk about that one let's talk about these five choices. <laughs> it's like, and, and i would have a price range you know but they were all really good pistols for self-defense for yeah. something or you know the the female would come in there and look at the pistol and they're like well you know so-and-so told me to get a revolver well the revolver is still in the cabinet here's yeah. a really good selection of i'm not trying to make a sale whatsoever i just want you to go out and i want you to pick two or three or you know what you can take all five back rent them shoot them and figure out which one you like figure out which one works for you yeah figure really? out which one you can actually shoot yeah but but my favorite YouTuber said this is the one the Navy SEALs use. Okay, yeah. we'll sell you that one too. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> come, come back and get that one later. But it's, I don't think we should be discouraging people to get, get if this is, if they're entering it, allow them to enter it. Yeah. Point and them remember in the there right was, direction. There was a time when you knew less about shooting oh, yeah. than they do now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And some of us had to go through years of doing things the wrong way and then, and then realize, oh, you know, crap. <laughs> yeah. I still, I was, I was showing a guy uh, a 
presentation the other night. I made a little video with my cell phone in my in my gun room. He's a he's a retired cop. He's getting into the dot life. Great guy, and he's like, uh, you know, I just the usual can't find the dot thing, yeah. right? And so I showed him some some dry fire reps. This is what my draw looks like. This is why I do it this way. You know, we're having the whole conversation again with being this startup thing. It never ends, right? I mean, we're this is nighttime. It's post dinner time, and I'm working on gun stuff in the gun room with it. With it. and he's a friend, you know, but I would do it for do it for anybody. Um, and <laughs> and I noticed a bad habit. I I I dip my head down. I still do it. I oh, yeah. was that sort of tactical turtle for years oh, yeah. and years, you know. And sure enough, I've, you know, I'm I'm I had my par time set to 1.26 on a draw from open, strong side right, and I'm beating a 126 because that was his record. Oh, I know I'd never be as fast as my old record when I was a cop. Well, I did a 126 once. Oh, let's let's see if I can beat that, you know, and find the dot right. So I'm a 126 and I'm and I'm doing it, but I can see my head just going. Boop. Yeah. <laughs> Kids at home. Bring the gun to where your eye already is. Don't bring, don't <laughs> throw the gun out here and then try to find it with your head. It's too many variables. You're moving too much stuff around. May, be a marionette. Have your head completely still. Still your head. Bring the gun to where your eye already is. Yeah. That's one of the tricks, yeah. one of the secrets. And I still don't do it. I, I can tell you. Do I do it? Mostly. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm the same way. I'm, I'll, <laughs> I think I probably told you before when I was shooting. Hey, if I start turtling, tell me. Yeah, you know, because you know? I mean, it's it's practiced it so much up until this point. Yeah, you know? I'll tell you guys a funny story. This is this this is a husband and wife Houston story. Houston people will understand this. So, <laughs> we're at Walgreens, and there's like a tweaker in there, making a mess of things, just throwing a fit berating this poor like Pakistani girl behind the counter who doesn't know any doesn't know how to deal with this at all guy's completely out of control right he's throwing stuff everywhere he's making a mess out of the displays my wife thinks he had probably stolen something had stuffed something down his pants and was doing it so he wouldn't mind when he left yeah and and he could get away with stealing something because we're just happy to have him out of the store that's what she thinks I think the guy was just high as a kite right so he makes his mess and he curses out everybody and uh, makes all these threats and stuff, and then he, and then he leaves. And my wife grabs me by the elbow and goes, "We're going to the car right now, Mister. You are way out of control." And I'm like, "What? I didn't say anything. I was just standing there. What?" She's like, "You were smiling. <laughs> <laughs> I saw where you put your feet, and then you did this." I turned my chin because I'm cross-eyed dominant, uh. and I used to the last thing I did before I draw. Was turn my chin to the right so I could look from my left eye and bring the gun up. That's so she could funny. tell I didn't say a word, but she knew I was getting ready to draw on this guy. <laughs> like, we're going to the car right now. <laughs> you, you were just waiting for the beep. Yeah, yep. I was wait, waiting for the yeah. beep. Let this guy pull out a knife or a gun or yeah. something, you know. Um, <laughs> speaking, speaking of convenience store, did anybody see the uh, the lighter fluid guy? Did you see that no. short? You see that short? Uh, I don't know where it was. Cop go, gets called to a Seven Eleven. And a dude's like spraying lighter food and setting stuff on fire. Some old homeless looking dude is setting stuff on fire. And it's like, it starts and the cops like putting out the fire with a fire extinguisher. And he starts yelling at the dude who's doing it. And the dude takes off and he puts out another fire and takes off after the guy. And there's somebody holding the door open. He runs out after the guy and the guy shoots lighter fluid on the cop. Right. So the cop runs back to his car. And he's yelling at another car that's responding, pulling up. He's like, hey, hey, that guy's covered in lighter fluid. Don't tase him. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Don't tase him. <laughs> yeah. Don't tase him. Cop, the, the dude turns to the cop car and starts spraying lighter fluid on the cop car. Cop car just goes, whoop. I'm like, yep, that's effective. Yeah. No sparks there. Ouch. Yeah, it was a good, it was a good short. <laughs> That was a good short. Worst Joker cosplay ever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you got coming up, Mike? Yeah, so what I've got coming up is um, we have a 1X prism scope uh, that I was getting excited about earlier. Big honking triangle in it, circle around the triangle, real easy to find, um, really nice glass in them. I have a prototype on my Hellion right now, to like peanut butter and jelly. I mean, that's a great combination. Um, but the reticle's 
I don't have I don't have my reticle yet, so I'm really looking forward to getting my reticle for the first time. That oh. should happen in like a couple of weeks. Nice. And then I I think I can say this. Um, I know I can say this because it's up to me. Um, <laughs> by Shot Show, we'll have two one to eights and a one to ten. One of the one to eights is in second focal plane, and one of them is in first focal plane. The only difference between second focal plane and first focal plane is the location of that reticle doublet circling around to what we talked about before. In a first focal plane, the reticle doublet is moved to the front of the optic. So um, all of the magnification happens after the light passes through it. So you're basically zooming with the reticle. You're zooming okay. in and out on the reticle, which is why in first focal plane, that's the one where it looks like the reticle is glued to the target. And mm-hmm. no matter what your magnification is, it's the same size relative to the target. That's because you're zooming, you're changing magnifications while looking through the reticle. Second focal plane, the reticle doublet is moved behind the magnification assembly. So it's the same size at all times. So I change my magnification, but the reticle seems to be glued to the inside of the scope. Mm-hmm. It doesn't change it doesn't change its size relative to my field of view, no matter what the magnification is. Both of them have their advantages and disadvantages. We're making both. Um, and then the last one is a one to ten which will be a big chunk. It's a 34-millimeter tube with a 28-millimeter objective lens. The problem with 1 to 10s, it's a jack-of-all-trade and a master of none. Yep. Even even a $2,000 razor has this issue of, at 10x, they get really hard to look through. Yep. Mm-hmm. The exit pupil gets too small. An exit pupil is the, the diameter of the shaft of light that's coming out the back of, of the optic. And at 10 power with a 24-millimeter objective lens, it's like I know these things, You have like a 2.3 to 2.7 millimeter exit pupil, which means my eye right now, my pupil in here is probably maybe four millimeters wide. If we were to take a pair of calipers and just hold it up to my eye, I'm seeing through about four millimeters, right? I have to line that up with 2.3 or 2.7 millimeters of light coming out the back of the optic in order to get a proper sight picture. Mm. That ain't so easy when I'm working a VTAC wall. And I'm on my side, flopped over in the dirt, you know, yeah. right? The, the, the 1 to 10s are hard to look at at, at, at maximum magnification. Yep. So how we can fix that a little bit is um, a little bit is by making some of the lenses bigger. Yeah. But the basic math is the same. And a lot of people don't understand that, that a razor or an attacker 1 to 10 has the same problem as a Swamp Fox Arrowhead 1 to 10. They're both 1 to 10s, and they share some of those some of those same issues yep. so you can't you can't spend your way out of math uh, <laughs> i wish you could right <laughs> That's uh, good. yeah i wish you could spend your way out of math but you can't so but we're doing one to ten it's going to be it'll be big and heavy um but it'll be a, like a great dmr optic it's not going to be for the lightweight guys <laughs> um but it's going to be it'll be affordable it's a super cool reticle in it um i think it's super cool because i i developed it um, it'll be basically like a circle dot with a, there's a BDC in the middle. It's kind of like your voodoo where there's a ring around it. Yeah. Right. So it draws your eye to the middle. And if you're at one X, you can just go plate, 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 plate. You're just putting like a ring on a ring or you can put a ring on whatever shape that you're trying to shoot at, but you can kind of center it in that ring and go fast. Right. And then once you get to 10 power, you've zoomed past it so it's no longer clouding your field of view you actually it grows and grows and grows until it's gone and then we'll have a couple of little stadias coming in from the side that are sort of references anyway be better just to show you a picture of it but i'm super excited so by shot show we should have that and then gideon will we started with pistol dots because um they're really hot right now Mm -hmm. there's a great market for them it's a crowded market but they're also affordable way to start out like if you only have a certain amount of money that you want to spend on your first batch of optics spending it on two hundred dollar i could either spend on a two hundred dollar red dot or i could spend it on like a six hundred dollar lpvo well i can buy three of these to sell for the cost of one of those to sell yeah right so that's the business side of it is is how can i start revenue how can i get the brand name out there how can i have something that's affordable to give to influencers I can give three YouTube guys a, a two hundred dollar optic for the price of one LPBO yeah. going to a YouTube guy, right? And th- those sort of things, um, you know, those are considerations you have to consider too. 
So we started out with pistol dots. It's been really strong. I'm really happy with what we've done. I'm really happy with the return rate so far, knock on wood. Um, I know what the return rates are like in, in the industry. It's really interesting. Most of the return rates are really similar. In other words, if you're, you send out 100 of these things, you're going to get two or three of them back pretty much no matter what. And Aimpoint also gets two or three back out of every 100. So does Gideon. So does so does PA. We get two or three back out of every 100. If you're starting to get five or six back out of every 100 that you send out, that's when you raise the red flag and go, hey, we got a problem. Mm-hmm. So it's really the, 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 the difference between an acceptable return rate and an unacceptable return rate is really, really small. That doesn't mean that we're just as good, just as good as Aimpoint. If they get a return rate of 2% and we get a return rate of 2%, are we just as good? No, because Aimpoint guys are doing Aimpoint stuff. They're treating their optics harder. They're jumping out of airplanes with them, and and they're doing uh, tactical games where it's like you know CrossFit with guns, and and yeah. they're they're harder on their their equipment, so they will break stuff more. The typical Gideon customer is not jumping out of airplanes and and swimming through salt water and doing all of that stuff, so. It doesn't mean just because of the return rate's the same. It's not the whole story, so it's it's really interesting how the math can lie to you too. Like yeah, don't yeah. don't take those. You know, Mark Twain says there's lies, damn lies, and statistics. You know, you can take those statistics and make yourself sound really good if you want to, but it's not it's not ever the whole truth. Yeah. yeah. So so where can our viewers find you? Uh, you can find Gideon Optics at GideonOptics.com. Wow, that okay. was easy. <laughs> um, uh, Aim Surplus is carrying them. Optics Planet is carrying them. We have a few others um, that are they're starting to carry it. Um, you can you can buy them straight off the Gideon Optics website. Nice. Um, and we'll have the other stuff. The new stuff is going to be coming out there. I'm really proud of them. They're they're a quality product for for a lot less. It's it's that high value. You know, it's not a Ferrari. Uh, we we sort of say internally in the company that you know we're we're a Toyota Camry, you know. There's like a lot not, of those on the road. It doesn't man. have spinning rims. Yeah, it doesn't have spinning rims, and, it, and you know it doesn't have a supercharger. Uh, you got to pay extra for all that stuff, but it will go two hundred thousand miles if you change the oil, okay. right? It does it does what you need it to do. It does dot stuff, mm-hmm. you know. So uh, and it's got a no BS warranty. There's only a handful of us in the company so far. We're in startup mode. So you, if you have a problem and you contact support at Gideon Optics, you're going to talk to one of us guys. It's going to be a real American guy that, that is a shooter and uses the product. That's another rant I have. I wouldn't buy a Porsche from a guy that takes the subway to work. you got to be a user of your product, yeah. right? I spend a lot of time at the range testing out stuff and taking classes and learning and trying to get better. You know, So then I know... I'm not a I'm not a competition winner, but I know what competition guys want. Mm-hmm. I know what they need. I do it. I, I'm I do it enough to know what what that requires. You know, I'm not a not a Navy SEAL, but I've I've talked to some guys who are who once were legitimate door kickers. I know what they need and what they're looking for. I can talk to those guys and learn from them. Mm-hmm. I don't have to be one. Um, but what I am is a redneck. I'm just that blue collar <laughs> guy at heart. I'm just. You know, we say at Shot Show there there are shooters who are trying to learn about the business, and then there are businessmen who are trying to learn about shooting. Yeah, that's Shot Show. I'm definitely the shooter who just worked his butt off and refused to say no until he eventually found some guys that would listen to him. But I'm a shooter first. The business stuff is the is the hard part for me. Yeah, for real. You know, for and real. there are business guys out there that know all about the business and they know about inventory and turns and percentages and financing and all that. And then they're like, so what's the difference between a red dot and a prism scope? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and that's okay. Like sometimes it takes, it takes both of those, but I will say that Gideon guys, we're all shooters. Nice. All of them are shooters. Fantastic, dude. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, Mike, thank you so much for coming down your, or coming up. Your site with your, you and uh, Tess. Where, do, where the can people find that if you're local? Com. Gun teachers. Yeah, it's just getting started. But. Yeah, I follow you. Y'all, y'all are doing some amazing stuff with that dude. Seriously, f- for for going out, like one of the things I've always wanted to do is go go do Range Master. Yeah. And I never never had the chance, but good on y'all for going out. The hardest thing about Range Master is explaining Range Master to people. Because Tom, <laughs> Tom Gibbons should be Tom Gibbons should be world famous, and he, and and he through his own modesty he isn't. But he isn't. Yeah. We, we we finished Range Master and we went out to eat at the local. Uh, the local Mexican restaurant place, and and Tom sat with his, with his, Tom sat facing the door, and I sat, you know, with my back to the door, and my wife sat with her back to the door, and we said, 
we're good. Because <laughs> at, in his early 70s, Tom is still clearly the most dangerous man in the room. Right. <laughs> and and, and he has, his decision-making and his ability to execute, and he has all those intangibles. He has those real skills where it doesn't matter if he's running a, a $200 red dot or a $700 red dot or iron sights. He is so far ahead. He has the skill set where if something went wrong, he would be putting three rounds in the chest of a lethal threat while I'm still going, sir, you can't do that in here. <laughs> right? That's the truth. That's awesome, so, man. Yeah, Range Master is awesome. Yeah. Congratulations on all your hard, hard work uh, paying off and where you're headed. Hey, I had fun, guys. And BTO has is, is been a friend of mine. I'm a customer. I have bought so much stuff from you guys. I'm, after we do this, I'm going to go into the showroom and see if there's any guns that I can't live without. <laughs> so, And I love the range. So you guys are doing a fantastic job. It's really been neat to Thank see you. how you've grown, too. Thank you, man. Thank yeah. you. Thanks for coming up. And if you've listened to our friend Michael here, Mike, talk about optics for the last hour and change we appreciate it because yeah. i definitely learned some stuff oh, about very very insightful. about gnomes and now like i was like man i wish i would have asked more questions on this but we're out of time so like subscribe check out gideon optics uh we are currently day two of our black friday sales and this is dropping on black friday so Ooh. happy thanksgiving hope yeah hope y'all had a good once you get done eating turkey yeah yeah. Do some shopping because we've got the deals. New deals are dropping every day until the 30th on BigTexOrdinance.com and BTOGear.com as well. Now is the time to buy. These are the good old days right yeah. now, yep. boys. Right, right here. If it's in stock, yeah, I mean, you know what changes. <laughs> You know what happens next year, and we actually mm-hmm. don't also know what happens next year, so right. there's no telling. Anyway, happy Thanksgiving from the crew. Yeah. Thanks for watching. Happy or listening. Good. Or both, or whatever. <laughs> and uh, once again, Ian is gone. He went to Revolver Roundup, so uh, I didn't ask him for a sign-off. I'll just say Happy Thanksgiving, and thanks for being part of the Big Tech's Ordnance family. <laughs>